Hi guys. So we're going on to our next group of vertebrates. Our next two groups that we're going to talk about tonight's video is on amphibians and reptiles. So by the end of this video you should understand what the differences are between reptiles and amphibians and also how each of the groups amphibians and reptiles do each of the following things. Breathe, feed, get rid of waste, reproduce, circulate blood, and regulate their body temperature. So as you go through the video please take notes on on these questions and I'll remind you again at the end. So first of all just some key characteristics about the two groups and so we're going to start with amphibians over here on the left. Amphibians were the first vertebrates to transition to land. Fish, have, fish were uh, in water. Examples of amphibians are frogs, toads, and salamanders. The word amphibian means double life, so amphi means double, life is bio, so amphibio is double life, so amphibian means that these vertebrates have a double life, meaning that their um, juvenile stage is in the water, like tadpoles, and then their adult stage um, can move to land, might go between land and water like a frog. Amphibians have limbs to support their weight on land like limbs being like legs and then they also have some adaptations to prevent water loss because when you move to land you don't have that constant water surrounding you all the time so you have to be able to keep water in and so they have mucus glands in their skin and they also have eyelids. Moving to land requires more efficient circulation because it's harder to pump blood on land than it, than it is in the water where you're buoyant. So now let's look over on the right at the reptiles. Reptiles are the first group that's fully land adapted. So um, whereas amphibians have part of their life in the water, part on land, reptiles, although there's some reptiles that are aquatic, uh, reptiles as a group are the first that are fully land adapted. And reptiles were the dominant um, land vertebrates from 280 million years ago to 65 million years ago until the dinosaurs went extinct. Some current examples of re uh, reptiles are lizards, snakes, and turtles. These guys have a lot of adaptations to prevent water loss also because they're living on land. They have thick scaly skin. Their lungs are more developed again because it takes um, takes more energy to breathe. They have their limbs underneath their body so instead of out to the side like amphibians have their limbs are underneath them and that allows them to move faster and to get their bellies up off the ground. They also have claws and teeth which help with um, feeding and with protecting themselves against predators. The amniotic egg is something we'll see in reptiles and also in birds later. Amniotic egg is a more developed egg than fish and amphibians have. The amniotic egg has more of a protective coating and then inside it actually has a food source for the developing um, embryo. And so what that allows is for the babies to get more developed in the egg before they hatch out. So let's look at respiration for both amphibians and reptiles. Amphibians breathe through their lungs, their skin, or both. So some do more of one or the other, some really use both. And so if they're breathing through their skin, it's just oxygen will diffuse through their moist skin. But that means that the skin has to be moist. So you kind of see there that frog skin is um, is wet and so it needs to be wet like that so that the uh, gases can diffuse through. If lungs are present, they're really pretty small, primitive, and inefficient, so not the greatest lungs. Whereas when we move to reptiles, they're no longer breathing uh, through their skin. They have more developed lungs. So this picture down here is a salamander. So the salamander goes with the amphibians and again you see that moist skin so they're able to diffuse the gases through their skin. <clears throat> for feeding and excretion. Remember excretion is getting rid of wastes. Amphibians 
since they have that double life, we call the change between the two life forms a metamorphosis. You might have heard that before, even with insects, like how butterflies start out as a larva, and then they go through metaf metamorphosis to become a butterfly. So in uh, amphibians, their young are aquatic, so they live in the water, things like tadpoles, um, and those young are herbivores. And since the young are in water, they're aquatic, just like fish, it doesn't, they can pee all the time and it doesn't matter um, if they excrete ammonia, which can be toxic because they don't let it build up. They just get rid of it right away because they're um, in water and they don't have to conserve water. Whereas when they're adults, um, the adult amphibians are carnivores, so they're eating things like insects. Um, or other smaller animals and then they excrete urea this is the nitrogenous waste that we excrete so um, it's not as toxic as ammonia so it can build up a little bit more it can um, they can hold it in their bladder and then get rid of it and um, it's not toxic to them and then by not peeing so much they're not losing as much water because they're on land now over to reptiles. Most reptiles are carnivores, and so they, um, you know, small reptiles might eat things like insects. Big ones might eat things like big fish. Um, so this is uh, an alligator eating. I think that's a fish. I don't really know, but um, reptiles have teeth and claws. So here's an example of some good reptile claws. Those help them capture and chew their food, and also to defend against predators. Reptiles, a lot of reptiles live in really dry areas and so they really want to prevent water loss. And so to do that, when they pee, it's not even like liquid. They excrete this thing called uric acid and it's white powder basically. Uh, and that's the same thing that birds excrete. And so um, it's, it might be a little bit liquidy, but it's mostly, um, mostly just that white powder. On to circulation and temperature regulation in both groups. For amphibians, again, remember, they're going through that metamorphosis, going from an aquatic young to an adult that's um, at least partially terrestrial. That means on land, right? So the young can have a two-chambered heart like fish do. Um, it's not very efficient, but since they're in the water, it does the trick. But then moving to land, um, because they're not buoyant and they're working with a lot more, um, a lot stronger gravity, there's a three-chambered heart to help them really pump their blood all the way through their body. And it's a double loop so that the, um, if you see here, the blood comes back to the heart twice. So um, it goes uh, out to the lungs and back to the heart and then out to the body and back to the heart. Whereas with fish and tadpoles, there's just a single loop. Amphibians are ectothermic. That means they get their um, their temperature is regulated by their surroundings. So sometimes that's called cold-blooded, but um, like we talked about in class, it's not. It doesn't mean that their blood is actually cold. It means that um, it changes with the environment. So over to reptiles. Reptiles have a three-chambered heart. So you see in this diagram down here. Um, similar to adult amphibians. They have a three-chambered heart and again it's a double loop where blood goes out to the lungs, back to the heart, out to the rest of the body, back to the heart. And um, crocodiles actually have a four-chambered heart which is like what humans have so it's a, um, a little bit stronger and even more efficient. And again uh, reptiles are ectothermic. We've all seen lizards or turtles basking on a rock and that's so that they can soak up the nice heat that um, the rock absorbs from the sun. And the good thing about being ectothermic for both amphibians and reptiles is it requires a lot less energy than being endothermic or warm-blooded like we are. Being ectothermic um, requires about one-tenth the amount of energy input. So they could eat one-tenth the amount that a, um, an endothermic animal does and still um, be able to serve. So for reproduction, Amphibians have external fertilization and most of them will lay their eggs in water. 
And I guess I left ectothermic on here to remind you again <laughs> that amphibians get um, regulate their temperature from their surroundings. I'm sorry that I left that on there on accident. But so amphibians lay their eggs in the water and they're externally fertilized. So you see here, these are this is an egg mass, I think of salamanders, and this is a frog on top of his egg mass. So they lay tons and tons of eggs. Um, but they just lay them kind of out in the water. In the spring, you can find egg masses if you're out in the woods and looking in um, little pools of water or at the sides of streams. Um, so they're not very well protected, so that's why they lay so many. For reptiles, there's internal fertilization, but then they'll still lay eggs. So the male fertilizes the female, while the egg is still in the body, then the female lays the eggs, and um, a lot of times they'll lay them like in a, uh, maybe in sand, cover them up in sand or a pile of dirt to keep them warm, and he, um, here's an example of a reptile egg. Some of them, some reptiles do keep their eggs inside and then give birth to live young, but most of them will lay them. And there's the amniotic egg that has food and protection for the embryo, and so the reptile can grow really pretty to it's pretty developed before hatching out because a lot of times most reptiles don't take care of their young they lay the eggs they put them in a nice safe place and then that's the last time that they'll see their um, see the babies uh, so you see the amniotic egg here there's a big yolk sac and that's all the food to support the the developing embryo and there's the leathery skin on the outside of the egg for extra protection so again, let's look at the things you should know at the end of the video. What are the differences between reptiles and amphibians? And how do they do each of these following things? Make sure you have good notes. I'll see you tomorrow.